Our next presenter is from a club you may have heard of. Um, he is the head of sports analytics at FC Barcelona, where he combines research on machine learning for football analytics and the development of statistical tools to aid coaches in their everyday analysis tasks. His role is centered in gathering questions from football coaches and providing practical applications built on top of high frequency positional data, tracking data for those of you who have heard it by other names. A typical week is centered in constant communication with football experts, mapping tactical concepts to algorithms, and heavy use of visualization to explain results. If all that sounds like a lot and very hard, that's why he has a degree in a master's in artificial intelligence and is currently a PhD candidate in artificial intelligence. Uh, many of you watching this at home potentially will know him as the man or one of the group that discovered how valuable it was that Lionel Messi wasn't running. Uh, we'd like to introduce Javier Fernandez. Thank you, Ted. Can you hear me, right? Yes? I cannot hear myself, but that's fine. So, um, something I always wondered, you know that football is a sport with the highest value of a point there is among all the top sports in the world, right? So, what this means is that uh, to achieve one point in football, and being one point, one goal, can change the game drastically from one moment to another. So, something that, uh, that happens oftenly that it, is that if you watch like a football footage like this one, just 30 seconds of a football footage, and you gather with football fans or, or game analysts or any kind of football expert, you might spend uh, either, either two, uh, uh, yeah, two hours explaining things that are happening on ball and off ball. You might see things such as uh, off ball creations and movements into space or value actions of players or an increased chance of uh, scoring a goal or how is the opponent block defending on a certain moment. But what is really hard is if you try to correlate any of these things you can observe with the likelihood of scoring a goal. Almost nothing relates or correlates directly with scoring goals, right? So um, this makes me wonder what is fo football about. And I would like to show a couple of videos uh, that relate that are things that we are that are supposed to be football, and they are, but they look so different that gives us an, uh, an idea of how complex this game can be. So th this is one of the most successful team in history, I think one of the better ones. A uh, lot of things ha happening there, very Johan Cruyff-like way of playing. You know well this uh, this team and these players. And you can see um, short passes, movements in space, total freedom of players, the ability to create space when there's no space, the ability to uh, connect directly with players, and basically creating value almost from nowhere. So that's possibly one image of what we can have of what football is. If you go a little bit back to the, to the, to the past, football can see or, or might seem as a different sport, right? If we see the total football Netherlands team, uh, which was pressed, uh, praised like one of the best team ever, uh, you can see things like, this is what I call high pressing, right? Really, really, really following players. It seems to have no order, but even though this is one of the ground based of the football that we like more today, and it's being played today, every day. And talking about high press, you have things like this, which basically looks crazy, <laughs> but this was happening in a very well-priced team. And also, you can have things like this that are also called football. I actually borrow, borrowed this idea from, from Paul Power that presented this some time ago. It's an, an incredible sequence of stuff going on. And definitely awful. This was awarded or named the worst 20 seconds in history of football. <laughs> so the thing is that if you merge these three things, the three things talk about football and provides a little bit of the idea of how complex this sport can be. So uh, what I've been wondering about among all the research it's been going, going on in the latest years, as you know, research in football is very novel. It's very, or it's in the early, early, early stages. Uh, and it makes sense that we are focusing on goals, but I wonder if we are focusing too much in finishing stages, right? 
You have some established metrics now that we can call it established, even though they're built in different ways. More or less, they mean the same thing, such as expected goals or non-shot expected goals or expected assists and expected goal change and build up and so on. Um, this can be very useful to describe what happened in a game or what happened in a possession or to provide a qualitative approach to uh, how much production in terms of offense or defense you are creating or receiving in a match. Definitely can allow you to simulate if you actually produce enough to win that match, to evaluate individual skills of players regarding you know, finishing, and things such as, um, yeah, most related with goals. But the main question is that, what can we provide to coaches or to game analysts when we're focusing so much in finishing stages? We can say what happened in that match, we can analyze a little bit if we are pro producing stuff, but what can we say with this uh, to them about what can you change uh, to make, uh, or what, how can this pro provide information of to, uh, to coaches, to say players, what to change and how to progress in the game? So basically what I want to focus a little bit now is uh, talking about context. Something we have missing a little bit in research in football is to try to um, understand that, the, that these sports breathe context and that we, we need to describe and to have a, 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 a good way of defining context in football in order to be able to explain this sport, right? So I'm just gonna provide several layers of things that we might consider as context in football that would allow us to filter information and to be more specific when we're trying to analyze football, right? Very, uh, very basic. For, for example, according to who owns the ball in a given moment, we might say that a possession can be split into in two main phases, right? A ball possession phase, you basically have the ball and you want to do things with it. Uh, it's supposed that you want to score goals, even though Johan Cruyff says that football is more a sport about or it's more about not losing the, the ball than, than scoring goals, that the first in, uh, yeah, in a strategy or tactic from team to team, but basically you want to have the possession of the ball and try to get there. And you might have a second phase in which you want to recover the ball, right? This is about who has the ball in a given moment. However, it depends pretty much of where you are now in a given phase of a possession, uh, what you want to do. For example, uh, when we talk about finishing stages, if we just analyze that, it's like we were analyzing what a chess master does by analyzing only his last 10 movements, right? But I like to see football at, uh, or just a single football possession as a series of micro objectives that have to be achieve in order to get to the, to the goal. In the finishing stage, you are in the final one and you want to score goals. But if you have the, the, the ball near your goal, what do you do? So we, we might talk about three di different phases, for example. Uh, a build-up phase in which you want to overcome the first line of pressure, basically, or probably you want to get uh, above the, uh, the, the half of your field in, in order to get the ball as a way as possible to your, to your goal and avoiding to losing it in dangerous positions. When you overcome that first line of pressure, you might be in a progression phase. This is just a proposal, this is the way we see it, but there's many ways of seeing that. In a progression phase, you want to move the, the, the ball around and you want to be able to overcome that pressure of the opponent block, but now you have a different game. Now you have different movements that you have to do in, or, in, in order to achieve, to get closer to the opponent's goal and be able to score. And then you finally get to the finishing stage. So this is two layers of contextual information that might allow us to filter the possession in order to be more specific when we're trying to analyze what's going on and how to solve that for every possible opponent we are, are playing against. But there's more with that. For example, oh, and a very important part is that the, those sequences of phases do not happen, happen necessarily one after 
another. You, you can go from build up to finishing. If you play long balls and direct play, you can go from progression to finishing. T typically and more oftenly in, in football, you can go back to phases. So you're solving different problems in a very complex way. So that's what is it's so important to grain down or to fine grain um, or, to, or to drill down uh, information in order to have fine grain analysis of what's going on. And if you keep filtering that and add another layer, you might say that according to the opponent's defensive block, you might face different problems. The opponent might be doing a high, uh, a high pressing, and then the behaviors and the kind of things you have to achieve their changes, or they might be doing a medium block. So you might be in build-up phase with high press, or, me or in build-up phase with medium block or full Re, re, uh, retreat. And this faces three different problems. Solutions are similar, but are not exactly the same thing. And just adding more layers, you have information about what's the actual or current game dynamics, what is going on on the game. You might have a counterattack, right, in which you recover the, the ball very far away from the opponent's goal, and you track a lot of of meters and there's some specific dynamics of movements and things and actions happening in that case. You might have a fast attack, which is similar to counter attack, but in this case, you recovered uh, in, the second half, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the second part of the field and you want to go as fast as possible to the opponent's goal. They might be organized, but not so much, so you want to take advantage of that. That proposes some other different game dynamics. Or you might face the, the most typical one, which is an organized or structured attack in which you're basically in control of the ball, the opponent team is organized and you need to overcome that, or even though you might be doing direct attack and long plays, right? So at the end, what we get is that all these different layers provide information about which is the context in which we are in, in every moment. We're typically trying to analyze a possession as a whole without taking into account this context and trying to just explain what happened. So the main idea here is that just basically saying that taking into account information as who has the ball, uh, how is the opponent block positioned, uh, what's the type of defensive pressure you are facing in a given moment, and what's the game dynamic, you're allowed to filter better in order to uh, evaluate football piece by piece. Basically, it's very complex sport, so it's a very good idea from a science point of view to drill it down to, a more, to more specific problems and then be able to analyze, to describe, or to maybe prescribe what can you do in order to overcome those. So, but now going a little bit more into the focus on this talk, you might be seeing that in some of, of these videos you have these blue circles around players, and this is where I want to focus now. This is basically something we are calling now off-ball advantage or positional advantage, or basically means that taking into account several factors, contextual information, spatial factors, and, and also some physics, you are, you are trying to identify which are the best passing options you have in every moment, or which players are creating enough space of value so they can get the ball there and you can solve these different micro objectives. So I'm going to explain a little bit how can we get there to explain basically how can we highlight those players automatically and what does that mean and what is that, I mean, what is that taking into account in order to be able to know uh, what could be the right pass in every moment. A note for the, for the non-believers on football, you might notice that many times the best passing options are behind. So there's like a little battle, uh, some people saying that pass, uh, pass passing back doesn't work in football, it makes no, no sense that you have to get the ball to the opponent's uh, box and work, but at least from a, a, a numerical standpoint, we can see that uh, it also makes sense uh, for the models. So there's something being, uh, that was done in basketball some years ago by an amazing group of people that is now in different places in the NBA, and they coined the term expected possession value. So what they uh, wanted to do in that moment, or what their main issue was to say, okay, can we quantify at every instance of time and any moment what's the likelihood of, in basketball, scoring zero, one, two, or three points, right? And 
can we measure this accounting for information such as what are the passing options, what's this spatial control we have in a given moment, and some other information about that. So when you, when you see that and understand how complex Foodle is, you might say, okay, uh, this, might, this makes sense, and this kind of model definitely could be very useful if you apply this to football. The thing is that if you want to get it uh, into football, you need to take into account different things. For example, possession in football is a bit more strange than in basketball. You can lose it and regain it very quickly and have di different kinds of, of, of dynamics. So you, you need to take that into account. The most important thing is that actions like passes can go anywhere on the field. So in basketball, you have to pass to the, uh, to the player's hand. And that, uh, for an, uh, an analysis, point of view makes it more simple, but in this case, we need to understand the whole field because passes can go anywhere. Actually, better passes or more uh, valuable ones don't go to the players' uh, feet. I mean, don't go to where the players are now, but where they're going to be in the next seconds where the, where the, packs, where the pass is going. And of course, taking into account context. So basically, what they did and what we do when we adapt this to, uh, uh, to football is to uh, try to quantify the expression that is basically how likely are you to get a goal against or a goal in favor uh, given all the information we have in a certain moment in time. What we do is that if you have a given moment in a, in a possession, you want to add all the information possible that you think is relevant not all the one you have, but all the one you think that is going to really describe that state, that state. And what we want to do is to integrate over all the possible path that state can take from historical data and get a number that is, that is telling you, basic, based on this spatial and contextual information, how likely it is that you're going to score or that you're going to lose the ball and get a goal against. So you take into account information like this. It's basically you know, how wide the field is, where is the opponent uh, block positioned in a given moment. You have information about dynamic lines. This is something that we call this way, but basically it's saying where is the opponent placed according to, to, to its different pressure lines. Uh, if you ask a football coach or analyst, maybe one of the first things they, they want to uh, evaluate in data is uh, pass that overcomes lines, right? That, that, pass, that sur surpass lines. And from them, from their, from their point of view, that's a very valuable uh, kind of information. And when we actually did that and observed that, we say, like, damn, it is a very valuable type of information. It definitely happens that when you have this kind of passes, uh, things uh, happen after that. So it's, a, it's an interesting kind of signal to get uh, value in football. You get, of course, spatial information about players, things such as who, who, who is pressing, who has more and less space. And since you have, this is based on tracking data, you have the location of players and information about basic physical information like passing lines and angles and distances and so on. So this is all the information you have to describe the state. And what you want to do is to do this with enough data and estimate what's the likelihood or what's, what's going to happen next based on what we have seen uh, in history in football. So at the end, it looks something like this. You have this little curve there, which is basically telling you uh, now it's in red because Sergio Roberto is, is uh, likely to lose the ball. He passes back, has more space, more options for Iniesta, and then that, that value keeps changing a lot. And something interesting about football is that it changes a lot. It goes up and down and up and down and up and down. And it's a game where the opponents try so much to keep order and to keep control of space. You need to move as fast as possible and as well as possible, but you also need to be able to read the possible options in the right moment and to act on that. So it doesn't go typically like a curve, that, that, like, a, like a line which goes up or goes down. It's uh, pretty variable. So what can you do with this sole variable? You can see like ba basic things such as is if you just ev evaluate the change in, in uh, like a drastic change in, in values, like the, the gradient of that curve, you can identify value actions of players. When, when you have this, this, this wide change here, it's because Roberto passed it back to Iniesta and then he had many options. So that pass is gonna be value more than other actions that you're, that you're seeing in that moment. So that's cool, that's just one single value. You can do things with that, but we're still talking about on-ball actions and what you can do with the ball and likelihood of scoring, and we want to go further away from that. 
so this is a big formula, but what we basically did was instead of estimating this as a whole and say like put all that information, then let, let, let's get just one value, we decomposed that expression in order to try to model the different components that impact uh, the context in that moment. This is basically assuming that in a given moment with a ball you can pass or do a ball drive or shot, you get the likelihood of doing that, then you, you get the probability of passing accurately or not, or losing the ball or not, and then you have the expectation or the value or the goals you might have if you actually make that pass or that drive or that shot. But then instead of just uh, assuming passes directly to your teammates, you assume passes can go anywhere on the field. So if you get all those different layers, it, it starts looking like something like this. This is just in red, the places in which if you were past there, you would have likely or higher likelihood of scoring at the end of that possession. And you have some of the different com components that uh, bring that together and that provide uh, information of how that final value is calculated. So we have information here for every single pixel in the image. And then if you grab that together, you have that single value that we show in that curve. What is this good for? I mean, a lot of numbers and colors and stuff. What we are trying to do here is to basically get different layers of information in the full space of a football field, right? Uh, instead of just answering one question, that is, okay, how likely I'm to score now, or how good was this possession, we want to have some kind of framework in which we can not just answer this question we have in, in, in this moment, but be able to answer new questions that we are likely uh, going to have in the future, which is typically what happens with game analysts and coaches. They, they might be wondering about something now, and you work in that, and you provide a solution for, for that. And then when they get these solutions, they're like, yeah, but the actual problem I have is this next problem. So if you every time take one month more to answer that next question, uh, there's never going to be like a fluid communication there. So you want to be able to have this framework of information to work. And what we have here is information about the value of state and the value of Passes and how likely it is to have a turnover there, and what will happen if you turn over there. Basically, saying things like it's going to be worse if you lose the ball against five opponents in front of your goal than if you do that next to his goal, and things like this. So, go, going a, a, bit, a bit smoother now to show a video. Uh, this is a little bit how this changes in, in time. Many colors, but basically, red means higher value. And you, you can see stuff like this one, for example. Uh, and Rakitic there is going to make a pass to Busquets, and you're going to see he's going to overcome this first line of pressure. The model is going to recognize that as valuable, so now it's going to light up in red when Busquets has the ball. Because he's in, in a good place, he has different, uh, different passing options. But he's, he's not able to make the pass, he has to backtrack, and the value of the field changes back again. And Madrid moves along, it's pressing, and the information changes. So this is what players probably, or I suppose, are seeing or interpreting. And you can see how complex and how uh, dynamic football can get. But the important thing is that you have this sole information for each pixel which, with you can work. So that's good, and uh, what I actually want to mention is that I'm going to talk a little bit about on-ball actions, but the main focus of the talk when I talk about off-ball advantage is to measure when these circles of these players light up, when they gain, gain space without getting the ball and are available to get the ball in better conditions. Conditions. If you're able to recognize that, you're able to say to the coach, okay, in these different con contextual uh, situations that you might face, this player is generating value in these zones, you might play with him. Or when this player is in control of the ball, these are the other players that are opening up spaces for them. Or when this player has the ball, this other player never has space, so we need to do something about it. So, Going to the on ball, his for, for, for example, cases in which Messi has a great increase in gradient of, in the possession. Basically means that he made some action that can be a ball drive or a ball drive followed by a pass that increases very likely or, or very highly the likelihood of scoring a ball, a goal. Not all are our goals, but you know. 
And so in, in, in some cases, there are more or less simple passes that open up space. In some cases, there are more impressive ball, ball, ball drives and passes that do stuff. If you change of player and you get to Arthur, you get that, that the kind of actions is quite different. You can have similar increases in the value of the possession, but if you start analyzing players, you might see that, the, that there's different profiles of how players decide in every, every moment. You can answer questions such as, how does a player value risk over reward? Uh, in which kind of, si of situations or pressing does the player prefer to pass back or to do like a safe pass or to take too much risk or to actually see some other player that is open up for space? If we change it back again and go to PK, now you see that it changes also drastically. We we can see, I think, pretty much directly that there's, uh, there's value in those actions, but not all those actions are equal. And that's the thing about football. If we just get these actions and summarize and, and talk about accuracy of passes and not take into account context and more things, we're not saying much about how's that player behaving. But now the interesting thing is that in these same actions in which we're, we are seeing Piquet valuable passes, we're not seeing uh, who was opening up, opening up space for him, who were in position to have, uh, have a better pass, and how did that, that player read his options in that moment. So what you're, what you're seeing now in blue circles is exactly that. And it's every time he has the ball, uh, players with higher valuable space are lighting it up. And you have Arthur there, and he sees that and plays that forward. Let's see other cases. And you can see that changed pretty drastically and has to do with the type of pressing the opponent does and the movements of players. And then sometimes you have no, 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 no options. You may get a little bit tense when players are just passing back to side and side, but maybe they're recognizing they have no actual option to progress or they don't want to take certain risk in a given moment. Another example is now from the side of a player, how does Rakitic uh, position himself in those places of positional advantage? It can vary greatly, but what you can do with this is to identify where and how is that player generating value off ball. And the second thing is, when has been that advantage being taken advantage of. I mean, where that pass, uh, when that pass actually happened, which is not very often, and can provide information to the coach about, uh, you know, how well are players behaving off ball. Just, just to see an, another one, Dembele now, and uh, basically what I want to highlight is that the kind of situations and the kind of movements changes. You have a forward doing a, doing a run up, that changes a lot. You might be uh, finding, finding spaces by the inside. The coach might ask him to find spaces by the outside. You can basically identify very specific things but that can allow to degrade or to fine grain evaluate uh, the behavior of that player. So the main difference of this is that uh, on the top you have the typical uh, heat map of location of players. And this is basically, what it does typically say is, where is the player tend to be? In red, in the second layer, you have where, the, where these players are positioned to create value. So what you can see is that it's quite less often that, we're, that the places in which they are located during the, the game. And in blue is those places where they were located and were not generating value, were subtracting value. Doesn't mean that they weren't doing right, but they, they were not in the, in the position of receiving the ball um, with conditions. So that's more or less it. I just want to, uh, want, to, want to finish with a video, and just since we're talking about you know, complexity in football and so on, I just read an, a very interesting piece of paragraph of uh, Jorge Val Valdano's book, uh, the Infinite Game. So I want to play this, this video and do some kind of soundtrack and read what he says that I, I think is, is pretty amazing and express pretty much what we, I think, all feel about this sport. So he says, if football were a person, it will die of laughter of theorists like me. Because even though we disentangle the game with a screwer, we will never see fully what's inside of it. He it says, it's a gigantic ball where everything fits. Emotions, 
illusions, cataclysms, dreams, nightmares, opinions, arguments, polemic. Everything starts back again in each match. He says, it's an example of renewable energy, a marvelous spectacle in a growing industry and in an accessible social phenomenon. He says that football is an infinite game. I think that's pretty cool. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.